Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming, especially on these rainy days. And again, just thanking and supporting for hosting us. We really appreciate it, Josh. If you can just come up for a second and welcome everybody, we truly appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Toll. I'm the pro bono partner for King and Spalding. And I just want to take a moment to welcome everybody and to thank you for coming to this important presentation. The firm has been so honored to partner with the center uh, on this important work. This is a really big part of our pro bono program, and we know firsthand how important this work is. I want to thank all of you for being here today and presenting to us. And again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. A hand of applause to Josh, because again, we got some free food. Okay. <laughs> we really appreciate the free our food. Pleasure. So thank you so much for that. That means a lot. So I just, again, want to give the audience, thank you for coming. We are really appreciate you guys. And as you know, this discussion is about child forced labor in the United States. And we have one of our panelists that will be joining us virtual, even Matu. And I want to just give a hand of applause to my team from the Human Trafficking Legal Center. So please give my team a hand of applause. And then I have Rashida Peru from our DC Task Force that will just come to talk a little bit about the DC Task Force because they're um, co-hosts for this event. So Rashida, can you please come up for a second? Thank you. And you guys can hear me right, right? I'm loud enough? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to see everyone here. My name is Rashida Prelo. I am the co-chair of the DC Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, I am a section chief in the child protection section in the office of the attorney general. Um, and I run a newly created CSEC unit um, within the family services division. And our division handles the civil prosecution of child abuse and neglect. And since January of 2018, we've had the pleasure of representing the Child Welfare Agency in Hope Court, which is a specialty treatment court for survivors of trafficking that are in the child welfare or the juvenile justice systems. So at what, as one of my many hats um, in that role, I also have the pleasure of being the co-chair of the DC Human Trafficking Task Force, which we share co-chairing responsibilities with the US Attorney's Office. And I can tell you that we are so thrilled. Uh, the DC Human Trafficking Task Force, I, I think I can speak for everybody and just say the larger community in the district that thinks that these issues are so important that are dedicated to educating the community about all of the dangers of trafficking um, and not only educating the community, but working collaboratively. That's part of what the task force is all about. We have in DC, we have just under 300 members from over 70 uh, federal, local uh, agencies, government agencies. We have a multitude of NGOs that we partner with. So it's really a place where like-minded people, passionate people come together to figure out, we do, we do trainings, we connect people, we build relationships, really to see how can we work together to eradicate this because trafficking, whether you're talking about labor or sex, it's really, it's a horrific crime against humanity, quite frankly. It is a public health crisis in my view because it touches all aspects of the survivor. Um, and I think it takes all aspects of the community to band together to work on this. So we are so thrilled. You've got, I, I'm sure I don't need to say that this panel is just absolutely amazing. And I just have to, give a little plug for Miss Kenya Davis, who in her former role uh, was the co-chair of the DC Human Trafficking Task Force, and she leaves really big shoes to fill. Um, so we just try our best, but I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Child forced labor is, you know, not something that is discussed enough. Um, and quite frankly, the labor side, I think, is really not something that is discussed enough. We have a lot of discussion about the sexual, uh, sexual side, especially when you're talking about minors, we've got a whole court dedicated to it in the district, but not enough about labor. So this is the first step. And I know we will learn a lot of information and hope walk away with ways that we can partner and work together um, on this very important issue. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashida. Um, so we're gonna get the panel started, but 
I don't, I'm not reading bios. We have a long bio if you want to find out about our amazing panelists. They're very Googleable. Okay, but I will let each panelist introduce themselves while they are talk, speaking. So our first speaker is going to be Kenya Davis. Like Rashida, you know, said, you know, she's an amazing speaker and she's an amazing person that has been doing a lot of work when it comes to fighting child labor in the United States. So Rashida, I, I mean, Kenya, I'm gonna leave it to you. We're matching today. That's what happens. <laughs> so I'm getting confused. So please welcome Kenya Davis. Thank you so much. The first I want to uh, thank you all for inviting me today to be a part of this event. It's so interesting to get to back to the public space uh, for the fight against human trafficking. Thank you, Denise Coleman, for hosting uh, this event. And to all of you who work tirelessly, part of the reason why I was able to go into private practice and still do this work is because of the work that all of you do, uh, the ways in which you raise awareness, the ways in which you fight this crime uh, has raised the profile amongst uh, people who now do what I do, which is work with corporations that fight uh, uh, labor trafficking and sex trafficking. So. Again, this way would not have been made for me, but for the work uh, that you all are doing and you're doing it every day. So thank you so much. So quickly, just to give a quick overview of the law so that we know sort of what we're talking about here today. Uh, as Rashida alluded to, we have a Trafficking Victims Protection Act, one that has been reauthorized several times, uh, that covers both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Pretty much everybody will know what the elements are for sex trafficking, especially when you're talking about children, because essentially anyone who's under the age of 18 cannot consent to be a participant in commercial sex. And then any adult that's involved in, in uh, commercial sex, if they are forced, if they are defrauded, or if they are coerced, then there's some illegal activity that has occurred and there's gonna be penalties under the federal statute. But when it comes to forced labor, it's a little bit more nuanced. And what I want to make sure we're talking about here and making clear is that there are instances of child labor, child labor that is illegal under our labor laws, right? So the, one of the first cases we're going to talk about is a case where the Labor Department is already doing an investigation about child labor that shouldn't happen just because people are too young to be working. That is, that is a, you know, American concept. It's one that we're very serious about in the United States, but that doesn't necessarily equal child labor trafficking. For the elements of child labor trafficking, we have to have the same elements we need for adults. We need some force, we need some fraud, we need some level of coercion that has happened. And the statutes, for those of you who are keeping notes, you're gonna look at uh, 15 USC, eight, uh, 15, I mean 18 USC 1581, 1584, 1589, but you're also gonna look at 1590 because one of the things we're gonna talk about here is that it's not just the person who directly traffics the child that may bring the child into the country under a debt bondage uh, arrangement or something of that sort and then force them to work without pay, right? We also under 1590, we're talking about people who facilitate. So if you, for instance, run the place that this child is working in, even though you didn't contract for this child to come work, you're gonna have some liability there. Uh, if you transported the child, not even having all of the, the elements around knowing exactly what was going on, but there are enough clues there that you could be aware, you're going to have some culpability as well. So when you look at those statutes, and you guys can, can look at those statutes a little bit more closely for those of you who want to work in this area. Just can you hear me now? Is that working? Okay. Uh, for those of you who are working in this area, uh, you want to look at those statutes because they lay out exactly what the elements are. Some of the cases we're going to talk about today, it's not just the fact that someone is a child that, that makes these cases, the types of cases that we want to look at when we're talking about labor trafficking. We also are looking at what are the elements that are in place to coerce the child, to force the child. And one of the reasons why we sort of 
all do this, and this is not something that's bad, we sort of focus on our immigrant population is because some of those elements are just automatically there, right? People are being, being brought into the country under false pretenses. There may be fake paperwork that's being used to bring them into the country. And there's a level of coercion there when a child knows, even at 12, 13, 14 years old, that I'm here and I'm not necessarily supposed to be here, right? And so that, that makes it even easier for a trafficker, for instance, to say, well, you have to do what I say, and otherwise I'm going to turn you in. But what we're going to also talk about today is that it happens for our children domestically as well. And they are elements that are present and our, my fellow panelists here are better equipped than anyone to talk about these elements that are present that make it also labor trafficking for our children here in the United States, right? So those, again, going back to those elements, force, you know, threats someone being told your family is going to be harmed, things will happen to your loved ones. All of those elements come together to make a fuller picture of forced labor as opposed to just child labor that we say is actionable and unlawful just by virtue of the child's age. So as we've laid that out and we know what sort of our ground rules are, we're gonna jump into just a few cases. And I was supposed to turn my timer on because you know us lawyers, we can be long-winded. <laughs> so I'm gonna do that. Okay, so the first case we're going to talk about, and thank you so much, Martina, for letting us know about this, is a case uh, that's being investigated right now by the Department of <laughs> Labor, but we think it will go the next step to actually having some elements uh, dealt with by the Department of Justice. Uh, this is a slaughterhouse case uh, out in the Midwest. Uh, these, the articles that came out about it were just in January of this year, so this is probably one of the most recent large cases that we're looking at. Um, and here, the Department of Labor is doing that sort of first layer, right, unlawful child uh, labor, because these are kids that people know are children, right, under the age of 18, under the age of 16, that are working in these slaughterhouses at night to clean them. And the conditions are horrific. We're talking about high chemical agents that none of us in this room would want to have to handle. Kids are showing up to school with burns on their hands from having to handle these chemicals. Um, and they are working in conditions where there's very little oversight in terms of safety for them and also in terms of whether or not they are being paid, whether or not they are being cared for in the way that they should. So we're talking OSHA rules, we're talking health and human services rules, even before we get to the point of forced labor uh, and trafficking. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. This is a picture of a worker. Uh, and I know when I first saw this picture, I thought, that's a kid. And I know that, you know, there's lots covering the person's face. Uh, but one of the ways in which defendants, when they are involved in a case like this, they'll say, well, you know, we, we have all the paperwork, right? Someone has given us the ID and this person here that you're looking at is definitely 22 or whatever number they have this person say. And they'll have the victim even say, sort of parrot that language. Yes, I'm, I'm 22, that's the age I need to be or 18 or whatever the age is that I'm supposed to be to be able to work here. But any reasonable observer can see that this is a kid. And so what they have found uh, in this, this particular, and again, it's the service agency, agency that's subcontracting with the slaughterhouse. So that's another way that there's sort of some distance put there between the people who benefit from the trafficking and those who actually participate in it, right? So here we have the Department of Labor is looking at the service uh, company that has contracted to bring these folks in to clean this slaughterhouse after, after hours. Uh, the, the suggestion here is that there are children that are working in this particular slaughterhouse that are between the, uh, that are 13 and 14 years old. Uh, there was a lawsuit filed by the government. Again, the Department of Labor filed this. Uh, and they're working on what's called um, kill floors. So kill floors are where, you know, the animals are actually slaughtered. So as you can imagine, there's animal fat, there are chemicals, it's like slippery, like almost like an ice skating rink in there. So there are safety elements that are there that would be tough on an adult but are particularly harsh for children. Uh, so we're hoping to see this case go forward. We're hoping to see uh, that the department 
uh, I'm calling on all my old colleagues from the Department of Justice to really look at this case, not only for this agency that brings these kids, th that brings the children in to work, but also for the slaughterhouse itself. Because again, we're out here, we're not there, and we are looking at this child saying that's a child. So if you are walking through as the GC, if you are walking through as the, the, the investigator general for that company, you got eyes too. And you should be able to see that this is a kid, these kids are too, that this person is too young to be working there and that there are problems with the conditions. The next case we wanna to go to, you can change that slide. It's one that is back in 2004. Now this particular case was one uh, that is very close to us right here in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, and I'm not gonna say too much about this case because we have the resident expert on this one. Uh, but what I will say is that uh, this is another instance where the, this case, the, the elements are a little bit different in that this was a child that was made to work inside the home and in a domestic, uh, uh, a domestic situation. And so again, that's very difficult for someone to examine from the outside looking in. But these defendants were not only, you know, engaging this child in involuntary servitude, but they were harboring her and they were bringing her in under false pretenses as to what uh, she was coming to do. And I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> and uh, I want, do you want to talk about it now or you want to come back to it? You will come back to it. Okay. Um, the next uh, couple we're going to talk about uh, is down in South Lake, Texas. Uh, these are the Therese. Uh, and in this particular instance, we had a uh, uh, two people uh, from, from citizens of Guinea who, again, brought a child into the country under false pretenses, saying that, pre presenting to the family that this is a child that's going to be educated in the United States, that there are going to be all these wonderful things that will happen as a result of them coming with this family. And then as soon as the child gets here, the child is made to care for children that are even close to their own age. So just imagine a peer of, you see your, you see your peers going off to school, you see your peers going off to baseball practice and soccer practice and gymnastics, and you're stuck working, um, even though you had been told and your family, you know, a lot of times we talk about these cases as if this is a person and we are, we are looking at the trauma that has happened to the actual victim, but we, we don't think as much about this family entrusted this child to these traffickers and how betrayed they feel that this is someone who has taken their child and, and, and done this horrible thing um, when they thought they were doing something good for their kid. Uh, and so we really have to also, when, we're, when we are practitioners and we are handling these cases, we have to be sensitive uh, to those issues. And in this case, it was, we, were, we were successful with the department that the, a jury convicted them um, they were forced to pay, and I know this is close to Martina's heart, $288,000 worth of restitution, and they were sentenced to seven years of prison time, which back 2000, um, back uh, 2018, that's, that was definitely something that, you know, you weren't seeing. Now we're, we're getting those bigger sentences. My last sentence for a trafficking case that involved a child was, of course, it was sex trafficking, but that was a 50 year sentence. Um, so we're starting to see harsher and harsher penalties. Uh, but again, we have so much more work to do. Um, the next case, again, we, we, are, we are blessed to have um, uh, an expert here with us that can speak to this particular case, but just for the purposes of really centering our conversation around the notion that Yes, we have forced child labor cases that happen as a result of children being brought into our country, but we also have forced child labor cases for kids who are right here, who were born here, who are U.S. citizens, who for purposes of the 13th Amendment, 14th and 15th, should have never, ever come anywhere close to the S word, slavery right? Because that's what we all were fighting for. That's what our country went to the Civil War for, right? And here we are in the 2000s, up into, up into this time, having children that were born as United States citizens 
enslaved right here in our country. And so uh, this particular case, uh, which Kendra is going to talk about, uh, is uh, the case of uh, a cult leader that basically used those elements, that, that fraud, that coercion, to bring in victims and their families and coerce them into working throughout the country, uh, being moved around so that there couldn't be those tracking systems that we have in place that Rashida and her colleagues work so hard with the notion that a child is in school. That's one of the ways we track a child. A child gets, child, gets health care. That's one of the ways that we track a child. This person made sure that children were being moved in such a way that those elements that we sort of have as safeguards were not working. The person also benefited from the fact that they were not in an environment that we now have that's been put in place by people like you of awareness, right? You're all sort of on high alert and more and more of our citizens are on high alert that when they see something, they need to say something, right? They've got hotlines that they can call. They've got elements that they can look for and red flags and trainings that are happening so that they see a child and they can start to think, hmm, maybe I should give a tip or maybe I should call in, right? That's not, that wasn't present at that time and it wasn't as prevalent. And so we're going to talk a little, we're going to talk more about that case. But, but again, we want to bring awareness to the fact that this is happening to children within our own community. And just as a segue here, I'll say that um, one of our sex trafficking cases that did have an element of labor trafficking, it happened less than 20 miles from here on South Capitol Street, Southeast, here in the, in the district. So we're not talking, even though Kansas is gonna be our focus for this particular case, we're not talking about just the Midwest or just some, you know, Ohio or some place where there, there are these other, other elements. We're talking about Greenbelt, Maryland. We're talking about DC. We're talking about Virginia. Um, and so we're gonna talk more about that case later. And then the last one that I want us to focus on um, that's our, the last slide. And you all can go and check out this, uh, this documentary. Uh, it's about a 2018 Ohio egg, uh, egg farm case. And I know we're all focused on the eggs right now because they're super expensive. <laughs> People are selling them like Lucy's, like three for 10 or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but in this particular case, again, we have a large corporation that has contracted out labor to a smaller um, uh, uh, company, and they and they're like, oh, we don't we don't know you know what's going on with those people that are working on our egg farm, but what was happening and what uh, between 2014 and 2018 is when this case was most active. I think the last person played in 2018 um, was that these subcontractors were going down to Guatemala getting. Uh, people, children out of their families, families where, quite frankly, and this is a, this is sort of a nuanced part of this discussion is families where children were working, right? Children work on farms, children help their families do all types of things. So the notion that your child is going to work and go to school is that it's not a foreign concept. But also there were promises made, promises made that these children would be educated, promises made that these children would be able to actually make a fair wage when they came to the United States. And certainly a notion that they would not have uh, the type of conditions that they were kept in. You guys can go and look at this documentary um, and find that the conditions were horrible. And thankfully those defendants were held to account, but we have much, much more work to do in our country concerning those larger corporations who are uh, hosting child, child forced labor traffickers on their grounds. Thank you so much, Kenya. A hand of applause to Kenya Davis. We really appreciate it. Um, again, you know, I'll do my own introduction. My name is Evelyn Chumbo, um, survivor activist, but the operation manager with the Human Trafficking Legal Center. Again, Kenya has demonstrated and talked about the issue of child forced labor in the United States. And as you're going to see in this panel, it happens foreign born and US. You know, as you, you know, the United States, you know, it happens at home. Child children are forced to work at home. They're forced to beg. They're on the street. They work in industry, factories, everywhere. And I'll just share a little bit um, of my case 
uh, my experience, um, Kenya had it, the Greenberg case is me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me, false promises, change, uh, and, you know, Kenya mentioned about false promises, you know, and false promises were made in my case. You know, for me, as a child age nine from Cameroon to the US, I just wanted to marry Will Smith. Okay, <laughs> I know a lot of you are sick of hearing it, you know, but yes. So when I was told that I was coming to the United States, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh Lord, Will Smith, I don't care what y'all say. I wanted to be with Will Smith, you know? <laughs> so, you know, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I was fascinated by the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I was fascinated by 90210, you know, the Cosby show, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And that is the story how my life got twisted upside down. Like most of us, you know, the dream was to marry Will Smith. But unfortunately, I came here and became a victim of domestic servitude at age nine, not in another state, right here in Maryland, right here, not far from the White House, you know, and it was, a, uh, my trafficker was a woman, you know, she had um, two kids and I was taking care of those two kids, age nine until 17, no schooling from that age until 17. But, you know, I got out, I got help, I got my GED, hoo hoo, you know, I got my degree. <laughs> and now I'm sharing my experience with you, you know, and just, just to let you know how the issue of forced labor is very bad, especially for some of us that work at home. You know, just think about it. A nine year old go girl, you know, being a mother at such a young age, you know, taking care of two kids, I slept on the floor. You know, I wasn't only physically, but emotionally abused. When, you know, uh, Kenya touched a little bit about trauma, you know, the trauma that I suffered, just not being able to see my parents until I, I was 27, you know, and then just sleeping in the floor in America. What happened to the Fresh Prince of Bella? What happened to that nice house? You know, it didn't happen. And you get to also hear that. And not only, it's not only foreign born, you know, you have US children that are being forced to beg on the street. They're being forced to work in crazy places, in hazardous places, you know, that the parents, like we are supposed to be in school. Kids are supposed to be in school. They're not supposed to be working. If you want someone to be a nanny, pay them the right amount and hire them. Next, Ima is joining us virtually from California. So Ima, please introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry, I wish I could be there in person, but I'm in California. Um, I don't get a chance to travel there uh, this week um to to speak in person so like what Evelyn mentioned my name is Ima and I'm a survivor of child labor trafficking um when and now I um a full-time medical billing and coding but previously I was working as a advocates and survival leadership program at CAS for um, over eight years and has been an advocate for since 2015, I would say so that I start immediately after I uh, graduate from social services after I escape from my trafficking situation. And um, I was trafficked here to the US in Los Angeles area specifically. Um, I was recruited um, when I was 17 years old. Um, at the year, at age of 16, I was, my parent arranged marriage for me. And, um, and of course it didn't go well. And um, so at that time, after I separated with my um, so-called husband, uh, I was desperately to leave my town and just go away as far as I can, because um, I felt ashamed, uh, not just with my family, but also with, um, you know, in the community. So I went to an agency, and which is very common um, in Asia, not just in Indonesia, but in Asia, it's very common when uh, children are working. 
um, you know, like uh, even though I was 17, I was recruited here. I didn't feel like I was a child. I was already a grown <laughs> woman. Um, so anyway, I um, came here with a false documentation. Um, they they changed my age, the recruiter person, the um, they changed my age in my passport. I was 21, oh, even though if you look at my, I mean, if you would see my pictures when I was 17 back then, I look, you know, look like a child. Um, but I was, they make my documentation um, that I'm 21. So I arrived here in the US, I was 17 years old and I was sold to a family to work as a domestic servitude and nanny. And I was in my situation for over three years. So by the time I escaped, um, I was 20 years old. And um, what I want to talk about today is the after escaping uh, uh, such a traumatic experience, uh, especially those that are traffic at such a young age. Um, well, I was already 17, but still, you know, like, at that time, my understanding now that, you know, our brain is still developing at that age. And um, so after escaping trauma, so I'm, I'm not talking just about my experience, but I'm also talking about experience of other survivors that have gone through this, that who had no um, opportunity to, to speak about their experience since I had experience working with so many survivors. So I'm also talking about their experience as well. So as, as a person who were trafficked and experiencing trauma um, at such a young age, so our mind is it's still even though I was already 20 by the time I was escaped, my mind was still, Amo was still 17. Because when you're experiencing trauma, your brain is stopped developing, I feel like. Um, I don't know if you all agree, but that's how I felt. You know, so after escaping trauma, it's, it's, um, it's hard for me to... To, to trust, it's hard for me to learn to be a grown up, uh, even though, you know, by the time I was 20, close to 21, but my brain development was still like, I'm still like a child. Imagine those who are trafficked since they were like four years old, nine years old, you know, like what Evelyn was saying earlier is, our brain is still in that stage of the time that we were traffic. So moving forward with our life, with experiencing trauma, it's very difficult. So as a, so, I want to talk also more about service provider, what they can help survivor after escaping their situation, especially for child labor. Um, so like you have to be like really patient and have them understand what they have gone through, what their what their um what their experience is not just you know it it, it is trauma and then it become you know post traumatic disorder which is PTSD and I think for 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 a young age it called complex trauma that can last a long time and also could even last for a lifetime because I work with many survivors that who are now at their 50 and when it comes to make a decision such as like like a grown-up decision you know like in you know relationship you know this type of thing about life about what decision their brain or still like a child like how can you help them moving forward at the age of 50 when their brain or still like at the age of 15 because that's when the time that they were traffic so it's very difficult to uh, to understand but as a as a service provider we have to 
um, help them go through and understanding that because as a person who are foreign born, we don't really go to psychiatrists, we don't go to therapy, you know, this type of thing is for crazy people. <laughs> so like, how can we encourage them to do that? Um, uh, I remember by the time I was, um, uh, have the courage, the ability to go to school, to learn English, you know, like surface were very limited for me at that time. But now I understand that there are more services for uh, youth, for young adult, uh, you know, transition age, um, uh, children that who were experiencing such a crime. Um, now is is uh, there are more services, but during my time at that time, like I remember, by the time I had the courage uh, and confidence to go to school, I was no longer qualified to be in these services that it was for uh, youth, which is up to twenty one, and I was like turning twenty one in three months, but I, you know, no longer qualified for that type of services. So I have to go, I have to go to adult school uh, instead of like the youth school, even though my mind and my brain were like, I feel like I'm still a child, you know, so it's, it's a very, um, uh, the experiencing, we all experience trauma, but when it comes to a minor, I think it's more difficult because of, of, uh, of their, brain development um so that's that's all what i want to say that also like learning how to, to be safe you know like i know survivor who are um it's hard for them to move forward even though they have been out of their situation 20 years ago 30 years ago it's really hard for them to move forward uh, in their life because they they experience such you know traumatic event during such a young age, um, so the impact is is huge. I, I wouldn't compare between adult survivor and you know minor or child survivor uh, when it's come to trafficking or trauma, but the impact um, of trauma to a child I think is it's more than to the adult and how can we uh, help them uh, move forward. So we'll talk more later in the question uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ima. And then talking of, speaking of trauma, you know, Bella is gonna talk more about, you know, trauma going from being a kid and not being an adult, as you can see, it's not really easy sharing your story. And just imagine just being a kid. You know, me and Ken, me and uh, Kendra Ross, we were the same age when our situation happened. And now we're an adult and it's still affecting us. You know, and not only that, as a mother now, it is also hard, like Emma said, you know, just being an adult, sometimes I act like a kid, sometimes I act like an adult because I was a a young adult at age nine and trauma is such a big issue that we really have to start taking it seriously. It doesn't matter what happened, but you are talking about children. So um, thank you, Ima, for that. So Bella, kick it off, sis. Well, thank you, Miss Evelyn. Can everyone hear me okay? Hi, everyone. And uh, for those of you who are joining us virtually, uh, thank you for being here um, as we, I guess, celebrated last day of Human Trafficking Month. Uh, my name is Bella Hunake. Uh, in my official capacity, I say official, but not really. Uh, in my day job, I work at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services in the Unaccompanied Children Division. Um, I also sit on the Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. Uh, I am not speaking on behalf of neither agencies today, nor the Advisory Council or HHS. Uh, I'm here solely on my individual capacity today. Um, I guess, you know, before I seg, uh, seg, seg my segment on trauma, uh, I just want to know how many of you uh, know what the ESG model is. Just raise your hand. ESG. Your hands are not up long enough. 
Okay, yes. Yeah, so, okay. Um, so that stands for environmental, social, and governance, right? And so how do we marry ESG model to the anti-trafficking movement as people? So uh, just by raise of hands, how many of you in governance or also virtually, Excellent. right? How many of you in government in this room? How many of you are just a part of public? And I see the State Department tip office is here today. Hi, State. Uh, sorry for calling you out. Uh, uh, so, so we have government, we have service providers. How many of you are service providers today? Okay. Um, and the rest of you, where are you coming from? Nonprofit. So I, I'm assuming service provision, direct provision. What else? I'm sorry. Policy advocacy. Um, so this ESG model speaks on what our roles are as professionals, as individuals, as, um, as uh, lawmakers, for those of you who are joining us who are a part of that group. Um, and so earlier, Ms. Davis, you talk a lot about uh, the prosecution aspect of the TVPA. Um, and how many of you know what the three Ps are? Everybody should know what the three Ps are. Uh, the three Ps of the TVP officially, right? We have protection. Protection, prosecution, prevention. prevention. Ooh, I got scared for a minute. Like we don't know what the three Ps are. So, you know, at the TVPA, uh, we know the protection, the prevention and prosecution. And also who knows what the four P is? Partnership, right? And then some people even use policy as a part of that. And so, Ms. David talked about the prosecution aspect of the TVPA, and most of us here talk a lot about service provision. Um, that could also include prevention or protection as well. Um, and so as we're, um, as we're having this conversation on human trafficking, we're thinking on our part on the environmental, social justice, and government aspect. Um, I just want to, you know, by show of hands, how many of you can confidently say in your capacity you are working to really model protection, prevention, okay, prosecution, and advocacy and policy. Um, and so my peers also on the panel today, we talk about, by the way, I will not be sharing my story today. I'm not here to give you that, guys that. So if you're looking for that, you might not get that today. Um, so, you know, as I'm thinking about these various, um, I really want to focus on partnership. I think that is uh, that some time uh, is so subtle in the anti-trafficking movement, um, and we have to continuously um, prioritize the needs of um, people who are being victimized at all front, and we have to really not have this hierarchy of victimization. So, Ms. Davis, you talk about not prioritizing or over prioritizing sex trafficking victims over labor trafficking victims of all kind, um, and so. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is that uh, in my official capacity, while I'm not here on that, uh, recently uh, the administration announced the Welcome Carps uh, program. How many of you know what that is? Okay, can you tell us what that is? It's a private public partnership to welcome asylum seekers and refugees into the United States. You can welcome. Yes, so in short, in previous time, uh, the government really uh, work with uh, resettlement agencies to welcome refugees in the country. But the welcome uh, co-ops program is gonna allow for citizens, private citizens, you and I, to welcome refugees in the country. And so the first thing that came to mind, this is, I was at work when this was announced. I think State Department, <laughs> you announced this. Uh, you know, I, the first thing I thought of is how many, I immediately started calculating how many people in that group would fall victim to labor trafficking. And if you work at any resettlement capacity, you know that you know people who are uh, segregated in sense of you know they are new into a space. There's a sense of desperation, right? And we're all aware of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We we all should be aware of that. That we have safety needs, we have emotional needs, we have all sorts of needs. So when when I heard that program being announced, that private citizens are now able to welcome people and, and sponsor them, the first thing I calculated was how many people of this group would fall victim to human trafficking, to labor trafficking, how many children, because they are newly resettled, because of desperation, will fall 
victim to labor trafficking or trafficking of any form, right? And so going back to this ES ESG model, what is our responsibility as those of us in public spaces, governing spaces, and also um, social spaces and service provision? What can we, how can we be proactive, right? Because you know, in all anti-trafficking movement, one trend we notice, all of us, is that we are reactive. Every services is after the fact, after people are victimized. What can we do? What can we prevent? So what if we start shifting the conversation into how can we be proactive? Using the ESG model, how can we be proactive so that when we know these programs are in place are going to start and be implemented? What actions can we take to make sure that we don't serve people after they've been wounded? You heard my colleague today talk about impact of trauma, which is very real. You don't even have to, uh, have acute trauma to really know the impact of pain on someone's regulatory nervous system. You don't have to, even if you've never experienced trauma, you might have been exposed to something that dysregulated you and violated you as a person, trafficking or not. So when we think about prevention, I think uh, being ahead of, of traffickers, I think being ahead of um, taking actions so that, you know, people are are not put in position where they're exploited. Um, and so that's my first focus. Um, the second would be uh, for those of you who uh, are in service provision, who are joining us online or in person today is really assessing the needs of uh, trafficking victims, labor trafficking victims as it changes, right? Nothing is fixed, right? You know, nothing in, in, in service provision is fixed. So when we talk about partnership, does it always require you to reinvent the wheel? Um, what does you know being 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 in your element mean to you? If you're good at you know uh, a service provision like signing up for Medicaid and social services, then do that. If you're not, what does the partnership part uh, play play? How, what role does that play in your day to day activities? So that could mean that you really become informed of other organizations that are doing like work. Um, so that you're not reinventing the wheel, because reinventing implied that you're going to make a lot of errors, and this population just cannot afford errors. They just can't, right? Not for any capacity. Um, partnership also look like interagency coordination. This is where I would talk about governance. You know, what is State Department tip off is doing? What's HHS tip off is doing? What is the President Interagency Task Force agency doing? How can we all collaborate on the agency level and, and collaborate? I don't mean just to get on a call and argue about the same policy in different ways and they have another call about the call. I mean, uh, what resources have you created? What grantees have you awarded that can work together? What does resource, resource sharing look like at an agency level? So again, responsibility from an ESG model, applying that what is our role as government? What is our role as service provider? What is our role as just general society on making sure that we're not placed on a reactionary mode when it comes to exploitation, but in the prevention mode? We have to place emphasis on the prevention mode. I know I can talk along all day, so how long do I have? You have two minutes. Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. Okay, um, so th there's another thing. The last point I want to focus on um, is, uh, you know, just sharing of resources. Um, uh, many of you might know this already, but, um, you know, we think about the three primary agency in government that lead anti-trafficking movement, right? We think about tip offices for whatever agencies. Um, you know, recently, uh, I, I share with you guys that I work with HHS, uh, and so I work a lot with people uh, on our company children from Central America into uh, the country. And so recently I was reviewing OVC e-guide. I didn't even know this existed. Uh, maybe that's just an error of mine as a professional, but as I looked through, I noticed how there were so many resources compelled in one location. And as you scan through it, you see there's legal service providers. Uh, there are resources for, um, uh, it's called the uh, Human Trafficking Task Force e-guide through uh, OVC. And so if you literally Google that, it, it came up with so many resources. If you're a legal provider, if you're a general public, if you're in a nonprofit setting, and it's all about resources. And so when I'm thinking about resource sharing, I think about to what extent are, your, are you as a private citizen uh, to what extent are you as a legal provider? To what extent are you as a, uh, you know, a, an attorney of degree using these resources to really inform your work on the ground? 
right? If we have all these resources up here and it's not transcending to the people down here, then our resources are useless, right? And, and, not, and not to demean the many work that many of you have been doing for years uh, on combating trafficking, I, I acknowledge and commend your, your dedication um, to this work, but I think we have to be proactive. Uh, traffickers work really hard. I know this from my own experience. They, re they work really hard because this is their job. You don't play with people's money like that. This is their job. This is their livelihood. This is their empire and they protect it. So we have to be proactive and continue to share resources among ourselves to partner up to make sure that people are not constantly victimized first. Um, the last part I want to talk about is vicarious trauma for you all as professionals who are working with trafficking victims, uh, wherever you fall in the arena. I see this all the time that um, our best people are emotionally and mentally burnt out. So I think resource sharing for yourselves, like when you're working with people who have been victimized and you've done this, this is your passion as a professional. What steps are you taking to make sure that you're not emotionally burnt out? that you're not experiencing that vicarious trauma as you're working with them. Um, I used to work at, at an agency where I serve as a monitoring, I monitor programs. And one thing I saw consistently is that the best people always leave. Not to say that people don't have professional development goals. I do, if you're hiring, <laughs> I do. But, but you know, it's said that when you work with a population, right, even if you're on a policy side, you're doing a lot of policy advocate, there is something that happened to you when you are constantly experiencing rejection. You advocate for something, it doesn't work. If you start to question your sense of self. You question your professional efficiency. And so I say, take care of yourselves, those of you online as well. And so what, does, what resources can you access or can you advocate for on behalf of yourself because we need the people that are on the good side, because there are people who are not on the good side of trafficking. Uh, there are people who benefit from individuals being trafficked. So we need people that are passionate. We need people who are constantly renewing their mind and, and, and their, their resources. We need the best of you to represent survivors. Those are currently victimized, those who will be victimized, and those who already have been victimized. So what does vicarious trauma look like in your professional role? And how does that impact in your performance or lack thereof? And so that's the aspect of trauma I wanted to talk about. I know Evelyn is like looking at me, so I will <laughs> conclude and I will take questions later. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, thank you so much, Bella, for the, helping me remember the three Ps. Do you guys remember the three Ps that kept, uh, Bella just said? Only more, only Martina and Mariah in the back. It seemed like you guys don't remember the three P's. Say it, if you remember the three P's, call it out. Protection, 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 protection. Look at that, Dwayne. You <laughs> forgot it. There you go. <laughs> and thank you so much, uh, Kendra, for joining us. If there was something that you wanted to touch on, it's your time. I'm giving you all, I'm giving you five minutes. You know, that way we can get to Q and A because I know we have some audience that got some amazing questions. And for those of you virtually, please send in your questions and we're going to get to it. If we cannot get to all the questions today, just email us, we'll get to you. Okay, so Kendra, if there was something you would like to touch on, just go ahead, sis. We're here for you. And please a hand of applause for Kendra Ross, because it's not easy to stand up here and share your experience. It's really not easy. It takes a lot of courage. And so we really have to admire the you know, survivors sharing their story because it takes a lot of courage to stand up here. So thank you, Kendra. Okay, we're gonna try this again. <laughs> uh, to avoid the waterworks again, I'm just gonna skip past the story yes. and yes. go to the after mm -hmm. uh, where I am now in life, uh, which is, um, it's been 10 years, maybe 11 years now since I have escaped uh, my trafficking situation. Um, and um, it's, still a struggle I am definitely in a far better place than I was when I left um and I think the universe has been just putting all the right people uh in my way uh not in my way like blocking me but <laughs> 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 um so one of we're 
two of the people I want to give a shout out to Betsy, uh, Betsy Hudson and Anand Ramana. They were my uh, pro bono lawyers um, that I met when I had uh, moved to a safe house in Virginia. Um, and they helped me sue my traffickers and um, and we actually won that lawsuit. You all can look that up online. Uh, I also did an interview with Megan Kelly to um, talk about it more and expose my lawyers. And it's, I mean, not my lawyers, my traffickers. Uh, um, so um, yeah, I would say that definitely it's good to have be proactive, like you said. Um, I didn't know the name of what I had went through, that it was trafficking. Um, so I wouldn't have been able to, I didn't know who I should go to to talk about things or to figure any of that out and get the resources that I needed um, when I first left. But um, eventually I, I got there, I think within three years after escaping. Um, and with what I live through, um, the effects of it, besides like the the mental and psychological um, and even physical strain of it, um, I struggle with working. Like I, I feel at this point, I'm I'm 31. And I feel like I should be retired mm -hmm. at this point in my life. Like I, yeah, <laughs> I am very burned out, um, but I have to work because that's the way the world works. Um, and yeah, so I just, it would be great to have resources for everyone who is experiencing the same um, to kind of give us a boost in life um, also. Uh, I'm still working on that that lawsuit of mine um, collecting. So that would have been great if I were a millionaire. I would I would be retired right now. <laughs> um, and that's um, that's kind of what I have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And again, prevention, protection of children is very important. And we really need to work hard, especially holding traffickers accountable for their action. I mean, you know, Kendra want to retire at age 31 because she's been working since she was nine, like myself. I want to retire right now, Martina. I'm telling you, put me <laughs> on retirement. So we're going to open it up for questions. So if you don't have, you know, we need questions. No question is a stupid question, please. We're here to learn. We want you to get all the insight. Like Bella said, if you're a service provider, you work in the government, because we need a lot of government to start taking traffic as accountable. We need lawyers. You know, I am so happy. Thank you so much, Josh, because for all the pro bono work, you know, Kendra mentioned it. We need more pro bono lawyers. I still need a pro bono lawyer right now. So any more questions? You know, we need questions, questions. But you know, you gotta be the first one. Can I just ask a question? Okay, ask okay, a question. Thank you, thank you for a really <laughs> wonderful panel. But my, my question is, you know, you all talked about the resources that are needed immediately after you escape. So if you could just talk about sort of what the resources were that you needed and what was wrong with the resources that you found, right? Like what needs to be done better when children leave situations of forced labor? Thank you. Is Emo there? Because I think Emo touched on this a little bit. Emo, do you want to take this one? No. She's I would say that um, well, housing, of course, is number one because you know after you escape from your situation, safety is important. It's not just safety of our, you know, physically, but having. Um, a safe housing and you know financial uh, safety that is really important and 
I would say um, connected to therapies. Um, but again, you know, like I said earlier, it's not easy to convince uh, survivor, especially for a national, to see psychiatrist um, because we think that we're not crazy, but because <laughs> we're not custom to that, you know. But now, you know, as an adult now, like I understand how important it is connected to to therapies and you know, um, immediate, especially for foreign national uh, connected to uh, education um, is very important because, you know, especially those who are uh, traffic at such a young age, we, you know, don't go to school. So we need to go to school, um, scholarship to continue our education, um, connected to, to job, you know, I, I remember is um, going back to the uh, doing work that I only know how to do, which is doing, doing uh, babysitting, nanny, domestic work, that's the only skill that I have. And being trafficked in that type of situation, it traumatized me to go back to that type of work. So like I need a skill, other skill that I can do in order for me to, to move on. Go ahead, uh, thank you. Uh, just to add on to that too. Oh, thank you. Um, I will say that, um, you know, I am of a firm belief that people cannot outrun what's inside of them. And so a lot of children who experience, you know, complex trauma or any sort of trauma, uh, there's this like deep need of, you know, really, you know, trauma causes your sense of self to be fragmented. You become like, it, it doesn't allow you to have coherent identity, right? Uh, and so I would say, you know, when children are removed from their safe environment and they are placed in a situation where they're exploited, that leaves a trace on their system, their internal system right so those neurotransmitters they are not allowed to they're not able to really stunt their development so i would say that you know during the victimization process i mean you're you're you know isolation when somebody when you're in isolation somebody can make you believe almost anything if somebody can have you in isolation and they they, they determine what you eat what time you eat when you eat what you do with your body what you do your thought over time it override who you actually are as a person. We see that in the domestic uh, uh, violence um, arena, and we see the same thing, right? People are the same, where our internal is the same. So when things like that happen to us, it almost, you always need a, a, a safe environment. Um, and so uh, when you are a minor and you're found as a minor and you are found as a traffic. So when I was discovered with 22 other girls and boys, we went into foster care. We went to the child welfare system. I mean, then you have replacement, right? So I think addressing complex trauma, um, it, it will be a pandemic of itself when you don't address people's complex trauma at the, at the initial stage, when you don't advocate, uh, you know, she talked a lot about therapy and, you know, there are such things as bad therapists. Um, and so, you know, when we say therapy, does the organization, does your service provision agency have the ability to provide quality mental health care, ongoing quality mental health care. So if you have a child who's nine, who was, who was victimized and, and she's in foster care, whatever situation, what does ongoing therapy look like? Quality care, how do we measure that, right? How do we make sure that the specialists they are needing to see are being seen, are, are actually providing that quality care? Because what they do to that person at that young age is going to determine who they are at 20, at 25, at 30, and then we, we think about looking at them when they have children, right? On the council, as I mentioned to you, we talk a lot about secondary, second generation approach of trauma, looking at people not as just, you are a single person that was victimized, but if we don't address what happened to you, you could have children, and therefore we have a whole generation that could be prevented at the onset. So I would say, you know, when we talk about policy advocacy, to what extent are we seeing Congress, we need more money specifically for mental health care for this population, ongoing, not, 
not 30 days, not competition of, you know, we are, you know, Bella, blah, 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 or Evelyn's agency, and we are doing this. There's a competition in anti-trafficking movement, but how, where can we have a unified front and say, you know what, we need this much for quality mental health care? Is it EMDR? Is it, what is it? What approach can we take to address the trauma? If you don't address that trauma, statistically, we know that trauma impact people. And so, you know, we can sit here and use us as a model victims and say, you know what, these people went to trafficking. Now look how great they are. But as many as us who are great today, there are as equal number of people who are suffering mm -hmm. both visibly through substance use or whatever and invisibly. It's, it's silent. So I would say, because I can talk a lot, yeah. <laughs> I would say is addressing complex trauma at the upfront, as, as, at the onset. I forgot what the question was. Why can I repeat your question? So what, you had said that you need resources when you escape as a child. So mm -hmm. what kinds of resources did you need? And what was bad about the resources that you found? Or what do we need to do better? What's, what's wrong with the system? Um, I wouldn't, I don't really have any complaints about the resources that I did find. Um, well, maybe the, the first therapist that I started seeing um, in Virginia, um, she I had a hard time explaining to her what I went through, and it was hard to get through with her because I was trying to avoid talking about things, so it was hard for her to help me, but eventually... I did just come out and tell her everything. And um, and she actually, she was the first step to getting to the safe house. She knew people who worked for the Polaris or Polaris mm -hmm. project. Um, and she got me in contact with them who got me in contact with another person who got me to, to where I live now. Um, and from there, uh, just the the safe house had lots of resources. My therapist that I currently see now, she's a trauma specialist. Um, so um, I think that I got, well, at least for the the, the therapy and the the lawyers. Um, I think that another resource would be, or um, it was already touched on, but. Um, like education. I, the last public grade that I finished was the fifth grade before um, being sent to Kansas and going to their school. And so um, like, I feel like there should be resources for survivors to get free education, get G Free, love, <laughs> free <and> education. <laughs> uh, and thankfully, I, I did um, complete my GED in 2018. I'm now in college, so, um, but I would, <laughs> uh, I mean, I would love to not be paying for school right now <laughs> and have those resources uh, provided to help me get ahead in life and be where I would like to be and to help me retire. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes. Thank you so much, um, you guys. I mean, resources. For me, you all said it. And the number one that I've heard, the chain, is therapy. You know, better therapy. Because just like, you know, um, uh, Ima mentioned, Bella mentioned, Kendra, you met. You mentioned, you know, I remember in my situation, for me, a great resource, number one, would have been probably to reunite with my family. <laughs> you know, if there was some sort of funds to help someone that is far born, you know, to reunite with their family, that would also be great. And then the second one, of course, when you go to therapy as a foreigner, like Ima mentioned, they put me in therapy that was really not something that I was used to because I come from another country. It would have been great if they explained what I was going into too. And under, if, the, if the therapy would even understand what trafficking is, you know, I think Kendra mentioned that. So we need to train a lot of therapists, especially if you're just gonna take this case into therapy, like, oh, just go solve your problem with this person, help that person that's gonna 
talk to us to get training. So, and then another one, you know, Bella, you mentioned, I got placed into foster care. You know, foster care is like a shelter for a lot of us that are foreigners born, and then they just put us into it. You know, I got placed into foster care in Southeast DC. And, you know, no matter what, yes, my trafficking situation was really bad. You know, I was in a home in Potomac in a nice big house, but yeah, I am, I got placed in a foster care system no offense, in the ghetto, in the hood. So, you know, so not only that, I was supposed to be safe. So safety is also another one, which is number one, I was supposed to be safe. But in foster care, I got pulled a gun, it, gun at. You know, there were so many things that I saw in that, in that environment. So housing is like one of the biggest thing, but then make sure that the housing is safe for that person, you know, and you were talking about children again. So those are, you know, those are the great resources that we need and education. I echo you, Kendra, we need free, you know, I don't want to deal with student loan, please. Like we're all paying for college. We all have to pay for it. And it would have been great if we had our restitution money, right? If we had our restitution money, we'd have been able to pay for our college, but unfortunately we don't. So we need to also work really hard in making sure that we get our restitution money. So next question. Yes. We have a couple of questions from the virtual audience, but maybe we can take uh, one more. So, so, yeah, we'll take one more, then we'll do virtual. I made Taurus. I have been prosecuted for trafficking. I also prosecuted for trafficking. My question is for Are Taurus a survivor? I understand that each survivor has its own set of rescues. Some of them get to the rescue, some of them get to the one of them. But there are those who uh, pursue litigation, whether it's civil or criminal. I would like to ask for those who pursue litigation or motivated litigation. To pursue what? Litigation. 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 So are you asking if we that we got the justice that we wanted as far as like the prosecution? What motivated you? Because I know some what was the motivation? Yeah, what was the motivation to continue with the litigation? Because others simply do not want to, to go through that whole process. But I know some did. Yeah. What about it? That's a good question. So I'll answer and then I'll let, um, you know, my parents, because my case was prosecuted and it went. And then again, my case came when I was 17 years old. And it came also at the time that my trafficker had also embezzled money for medical fraud. <laughs> you know, so it was a lot that I was dealing with. And I would tell you what motivated me was having a great lawyer. Her name was Melanie on her. Just having a great lawyer that was helping me to understand that what happened to me was wrong and me speaking and giving me the option to say, hey, if you want to speak up, it's up to you. But if you don't, we can walk out of this room, honey, and just go to Taco Bell, you know? So, <laughs> but you sharing your experience and you going through this case, because it was very hard because I had to see my trafficker again. This is someone that, you know, I mean, like I literally take off my clothes. For me, she was like a monster, <laughs> you know? So imagine standing in that court, you have to testify. And I literally have to see this woman and Melanie, like I said, great, uh, just having a great lawyer around. You know, she gave me this ball to like, hey, you can do this, but she encouraged me. You know, she just encouraged your clients, just help them, but also give them a choice. So the fact that she gave me a choice and the fact that she was there and helping me understand my rights, knowing that what happened to me is wrong, because a lot of times we are told that, especially coming from the country I come from, we are told that, oh no, you're supposed to obey your elders when you come here, do as they say, do this, don't go to court. And it was a lot of threats. My family got threatened. I was getting threatened. I had to go from houses to houses. So the courage was really having a great lawyer and, and telling me that I can do this because what she did was bad. So um, um, so your question is for those of us who pursue litigation, what was like our driving motivation? Um, I unfortunately didn't because I was young. I didn't even know what that, I just needed a home, somewhere where I could stay for more than seven days. And so that wasn't a priority, but as I have gotten older and I've tried to retract, obviously it was too late, uh, but it was also for Ms. Davis, maybe may speak on this, but, you know, you know, in 2008, 2009, when my situation happened, the judge order, I think it was an order of restitution, but something was missing in that, that, so 
while the order was in place, I couldn't pursue the actual money. Um, so there was a lot of like uncertainty with that, but I think, I, I hope things have improved since then. Uh, but I think there are just various factors that contribute to, you know, being like, it's not a space, you know, lack of awareness that that's even a thing. Uh, sometimes you're just grateful to survive the situation and you figure the rest out. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I wanna, I, I'm conscious of time, so. The driving, okay. uh, I would say the driving force was just being honest. One was revenge. Um, <laughs> I definitely wanted revenge for all, but literally my life was stolen. I had no chance to be a child and I was forced to grow up way before I should have been growing up. So I wanted them to pay for that. Um, and uh, justice, just I, I wanted, well, I feel like revenge and justice kind of are the same in this situation. Uh, that's, that's pretty much it. And just to expose it, because there are a lot of people who are affected by um, the, the leader of this cult. And there are a lot of people who were afraid to come out and I had reached out to people before I even filed to see if they would want to uh, join in on this lawsuit and to get justice as well. Um, but of course there's that fear factor um, and a lot of people were afraid to do it. I was afraid to do it too. Um, but I just think that I don't know what came over me or what <laughs> but I was just like I'm gonna do it and my lawyers were I mean they always asked me like are you sure are you sure you want to do this because it's going to be hard it's going to be difficult and I did go through a lot of um, like mental health crisis um, when I was in the process of filing this lawsuit and had to pause take pauses but I kept kept with it and that was my motivation. Like I wanted them to to pay for what they did. Um, I know I'm almost in time here, but I want to. Uh, I mean, I want to add something. That's a good question. Um, I've had so many things for me. I'm a solid survivor, and just like to my strategy. So for me, as Kendra said, revenge mm -hmm. is, and also I want to take. Uh, I'm gonna take back my power because uh, when I was trying my strategy, I used a lot of threatening, including also. Um, mentioning like I mean like I mean bragging about like immunity the way you need it that way it is so even up to this day in my head so when I opened the case as Bella said I didn't proceed to a civil case because that time I was scared but later after I met my lawyer and understand the way immunity uh, I understand like that okay that was her privilege immunity because we have immunity so I was like no way this cannot continue to happen. Then, like learning later that is happening to other people like me because I was trusted by a diplomat. So I wanted to take my power back and to revenge. That's what what motivated me. Thank you, Finance. And we're gonna take the two questions that are coming virtually. What's the first one? And Imo, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, please. Can I start with the first question? Yes, please. Um, so on the topic of prevention, what can companies do to prevent child trafficking, especially when there is use of false documentation? So maybe we can start with Kenya. Kenya. Yes. So Kenya. Uh, what we advise is that uh, just like a company has to have due diligence, let's say you're a food company, you have to have due diligence around food safety, how the food is handled, making sure that your end consumer doesn't get poisoned by whatever it is that you've made, or you're a drug manufacturer, same thing, right? There's a level of due diligence you have about how you pull this food out of the ground and how you handle it. The same due diligence that you have about things that you think will impact your customer, that's the same level of due diligence you need to have about child forced labor. Uh, in your supply chain, both internationally and domestically, you need to have audits that happen frequently. You need to have spot checks that occur. You need to have survivors be your advisors, right? And to come in and help you figure out what's the best thing in terms of having a compliance program. You can hire attorneys to help you do that. 
Uh, but there are so many organizations, and, and to your point earlier, Bella, about uh, partnerships and really pulling on the resources of the people in this community who've done this work for so long. They've got tip sheets and all types of signs that you can use in your corporate environment to find where these children are and, and figure out whether or not the child that's on paper as 18 is actually a human being who is 18 as opposed to 13. But sometimes you just got to go and actually look for yourself and do that level of diligent auditing that you would do if you were dealing with somebody uh, being harmed by your product. Say something on that, Bella, Sandra, Ima? Ima, do you want to answer the question? Anatua, can you repeat the question, please? Um, on the topic of prevention, what can companies do to prevent child trafficking, especially when there is use of false documentation? I think uh, Ms. Davis spoke uh, quietly on this, you know, in terms of supply chain, um, you, your company shouldn't be known as a company that's irresponsible uh, and, and one that is not checking the, the certification of the people that you're subcontracting. So if you've been using a vendor for 10 years, uh, to what extent do you still hold that vendor responsible to make sure that they meet the requirements as laid out by both the government and also your internal policy. So I think, you know, as she mentioned, she covered most of it is auditing and also like accountability from a, a company perspective, but also from just a, a, a supply chain provider perspective. Thank you. Can we have the second virtual question, please? This is a question from the audience. There's a lot of conversation about specialized housing needed for survivors of trafficking. But from my experience working for CASA, court appointed special advocates, children who come out of trafficking go into foster care. There are very few specialized placements within foster care. How can we reform this? How can we advocate for change in this area? I can take this because this is, yep. I love, this is my, child welfare, it's my thing. Um, you know, I think this is where the social uh, community comes in. Um, there isn't, you know, like foster care reform is a topic that I think that was happening before I was even born. So um, I think it talked to the state, obviously the government can't tell the state what to do, but is in your states, um, how can you get the nonprofits to work together for a specific cause? Uh, there isn't a specialized um, a specialized placement, but there are, uh, especially for foreign national in my reality, there are ways in which, you know, there are special funding programs where these children can go to. Uh, but I think advocacy looks like policy, but it will have to require reform of the entire foster care system um, because we want, we don't want to, to support anything that prioritizes uh, hierarchy of victimization. So all children in foster care need a safe placement and that requires a lot of advocacy but you know there is a lot of these movements that happen in states um but i think it require all of us to have a unified front on picking a cause in foster care to fight about is it abuse is it housing is it shelter on the housing situation we are dealing with a lot of um trauma from these kids. So I, I wouldn't fault the placements. Sometimes some placements are terrible, but when you've gone through foster care, you know, they are very high needs. So you have to address the psychological needs because it almost all the time it ties to the housing needs. Families will be like, you know, we don't want you here and you have to move. They will be like, we don't want this child here. We thought this person was, you know, we thought we were doing the godly work of taking this kid in, but this kid is reacting. And then almost immediately you have to move. So I think again, addressing the psychological needs of these kids and also funding placement or, or equipping foster homes or uh, group homes with the resources that they see children as children that something happened to. Not, you know, my favorite psychologist, don't ask Bruce Perry, don't ask these people what's wrong with you, but what's happened to you. And so we have to pick a cause and, and consistently advocate for that. Thank you so much, Bella. And thank you all for the amazing presentation. Um, I was gonna give you the chance for one more question. If you guys had it, just one more, cause we're wrapping up. Sure. You do? Okay. So um, what do you think um, like a 
they are like, how do you identify? So I don't know who you are doing this exercise with the people here. So why do you think like the role of like the MDK in Chiba State Commitment? Bella. Okay, it is you. Um, I don't want to be the, you know, I can talk. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, I can talk, you know, I can talk. Um, you know, like again, um, I think it depends on, okay. So where I grew up, Michigan, if you're in foster care till you're 21 and you will get health care, you know? And so, you know, I, I, I'm hesitant to say this is the way, because that will mean that everybody include in people, people who are survivors of crime, we have to recognize that there is a subset of our society that something happened to you. And because they had this little delay, we, they require special care. I can't say that victims of trafficking must receive this certain health care. That means that I also have to say victims of domestic violence require this. Victims of, we have to have a standard form of care across people who are victims of crime. And so I don't know what the answer is, but I think pick a cause, find other group that are fighting for that cause and push that until you see movement. That's what I do. Um, and so that's what I would say. I, I don't think there is a way for victims of, there isn't right now, at least to my knowledge, where we say victims of trafficking must receive uh, healthcare benefits until infinity. But what we could do is, you know, financial literacy, education, so that they can have self efficiency so they can get a job somewhere safe where they can obtain employment you know independence because if we create a sister system of interdependence that means that they're forever going to be in a box but if we equip with mental health care we equip with education and support it will put them in a situation where their resilience is amplified so that they can go on and be and change the world and fight trafficking so i don't think that this might not be a majority opinion, but I don't think that we can have a special healthcare access for victims of trafficking. We have to standardize their call all survivors of crime. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. And if we did not get to all your questions, especially for our folks online, please, you can send a question. And maybe if you have a specific question for one of our partners, maybe we can email it to them and they can address it. I really want to give a big thank you to Kenya, Kendra, Ima, Bella, and myself for this amazing <laughs> <laughs> presentation. <laughs> And the key word here is, you know, there's so much that needs to be done to fight child labor in the United States. You know, number one, we need to do prevention. And number two, stronger policy. And number three, free education for, for all of us survivors, free education. And the last and not least, you know, we need to really work on the oversight and prosecution as far as like labor trafficking is concerned. Again, children are not supposed to be working. They are supposed to be in school getting free education. So please give a hand of applause to our panelists and a special shout out to King and Spartan. Josh, thank you so much. I have to sign up for this one. Okay. <laughs> So thank you all so much. Thank you for my uh, you know, virtual folks. Thank you guys so, so much. And thank you for the free food, you know. And Sal, <laughs> thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Merci beaucoup. Thank you all so much for coming and for turning virtual.